Hi, welcome to Chemistry 3006, the hydrosphere. We're going to talk a little more about the activity coefficient, how to understand it, what it means, and what it looks like for different species. Okay, so first thing is, here is a particular solution, representation, not very good, I'll admit, it's a bit blurred, but inside here we have a particular species in yellow, which is, that's the solute, dissolved in some polar solvent. And the polar solvent has positively charged species or a negatively charged species, or perhaps dipolar species. But this is a kind of representation of a dilute solute in a, a charged um, a solvent. Now, in an electrolyte solution like this, the activity of this species, we can call it, say, I, so brackets I, that quantity brackets I, the activity, is usually less than the concentration. It's less than the concentration. Why is that? Because most of the forces in chemistry are electrical forces. They're electrical forces. And activities are related to energies. Activity is related to the K constant, the K constant is related to delta G, for example, by the Nernst equation. Uh, delta G equals delta G naught plus RT ln K, right? Delta G are energies. Okay, so constant activities are somehow related to energies of interaction. That's the point I want to say. Now, this is a negative ion in solution. Imagine its energy when it's interacting with another uh, negative ion. If there are positive ions around it, the interaction energy between those two negative particles will be less. It will be less than what you expect because there are surrounding positive charges. From the point of view of another negative charge, it doesn't see this full negative charge. It sees the shielded negative charge. Um, so the repulsion between those two negative things is not as great as it would be. So the shielding of... Uh, charged solvents, that uh, charged solute particles by uh, oppositely charged solute particles leads to an effective concentration which is less than the actual concentration and that's due to non-specific long-range electrostatic interactions. So that's basically the explanation of that. The picture shows how positive charges blue surround the negative yellow charge in solution, just redu re thus reducing the effective concentration of negative charges in solution. It seems as if there are fewer negatively charged charges in solution than there actually are, i.e. a reduced concentration due to, to the neutralizing or shielding effect of the positive charges. That's how to understand it. Okay. Um, we expect the activity coefficient to be equal to 1 for dilute solutions. Why is that? Can you think of that? Why would that be? Well, if the solution is very dilute, what we expect to see is a negatively charged uh, particle, for example this yellow one, and another one, perhaps a positive charge floating a long way away, a really a long way away, if it's dilute. So actually the interactions between these particles can more or less be ignored in a dilute solution. In a very, very dilute solution, the negative and positive particles just ignore each other. Any effects that come because of those uh, charged particles will be colligative effects. Colligative effects are simply those that don't really depend too much on the nature of what's been going into the solution uh, and they don't really depend on the interactions between them. What are colligative properties? Things like freezing point depression, boiling point elevation. So the interactions are too weak to worry about and that's why when the sol solute is very dilute its activity coefficient may as well be uh, the same as its effective concentration. We expect the activity con 
By the same token, we expect this activity coefficient to decrease with increasing concentration of charged species because they start getting closer and they start interacting. And when they start interacting, then the shielding effects become stronger. Uh, now, what could possibly determine um, this shielding effect? Well, it's quite clear that the activity which is related to these interactions depends on all the other species in solution. So somehow, in order to model the activity, we need to model the concentration of all these other charged species in solution. It turns out that from debye huckel theory that the activity coefficient is best described as a function of a particular kind of quantity called the ionic strength. I've talked about ionic strength a bit in the previous mini lectures and here is the formula for it. You need to know this. This is something that you just have to memorize because it's so important. The ionic strength is equal to half times the sum of the concentration of the species I times its charge Z squared times its charge Z squared. So it is not equal to just the sum of the concentrations of all the species. It is half times the sum of the concentrations of all the species times their charge squared. So what does that mean? That means a sulfate ion which has charge minus 2, its concentration has to be multiplied by minus 2 squared. That's 4. A phosphate which has a charge 3 minus, um, its activity has to be multiplied its concentration has to be multiplied by charge minus 3 times minus 3, that's 9. So you can see that the effect of charge goes as z squared. And that basically means that if these purple charges, instead of being plus 1, are plus 2, they have a greater shielding effect. And that is what's going on with this formula for ionic strength. So Zi is the charge of the I species in solution and I is concentration. Remember that. Why does it happen like that? You have to read and understand the debye huckel theory. Uh, you have to know basic physics, Boltzmann distribution, and a few other nice things to derive this beautiful result. What happens to the ionic strength if you double the charge on each species? Well, I think we've pretty much covered that but be careful because whenever you double the charge on each species for example HCl to calcium sulfate not only do you double the sulfate to minus 2 but the calcium goes to plus 2 so each of those goes to um, in the case of HCl the Z's would be 1 uh, and a 1 molar HCl solution would be 1 molar times 1 plus 1 molar times 1, so that's 2 times 1 half. So a 1 molar solution would have ionic strength 1. What about a 1 molar calcium sulfate solution? Okay, so that's 1. Uh, what about a 1 molar calcium sulfate solution? That would be 1 times minus 2 for the sulfate, that's 4, plus 1 times plus, plus 2 squared, that's for the calcium, that's 4 again. So that gives us 1 times 4 plus 1 times 4 summation, 1 for the calcium, 1 for the sulfate, that gives us 8, and then we have to halve it, which gives us 4. So it goes up by a factor of 4. How do the activity coefficients behave with ionic strength? Um, well, the activity coefficients can't be measured directly, but we can uh, measure the mean, the geometric mean of the activity coefficients in the solution. That's because basically whenever we dissolve a plus thing, we always have a negative thing in the solution. We can't just have plus things in solution or negative things in solutions. As far as I know, there's always ch charge balance. So all we can do is extract the mean uh, 
activity coefficient for the charge species. For a single charge species, it would be F plus minus, uh, well, F plus minus represents the same value for the plus and the minus value, would be the same coefficient. Now, here's a graph of that quantity, F plus minus, versus ionic strength for different quantities. Now, F goes, it's just a factor, a factor between 0 and 1, F plus minus here on this terrible graph going from point 0.1 to 1 and on this axis we have ionic strength going from 0 to 2.5 for different solutions HCl, NaCl, sodium sulfate, blah blah blah. What do we see? Um, here are the actual data points these plus signs are for HCl, these circles are for NaCl, triangles for NaClO4. These are all one-to-one -one salts up here meaning one plus charge to a one minus charge, Na plus and HCl. These are one to two species here, MgCl2, one magnesium to two chlorines, and here is a two to one uh, species, which we can put down as a one to two, so it's two sodiums to one sulfate. So, um, and here are the models. Here's a model curve called coming from the Davies equation. And what do we see? Um, well, the model gets very good as the solution goes closer to zero. So all these one-to-one -one salts are quite different at high ionic strength. See the deviation up here. And they all start to come closer and closer together at very low ionic strength. And when ionic strength goes to zero, all the measurements go to one, meaning to say at dilute concentrations, the ionic species, the F constants, go to 1. But how quickly do they go to 1? Well, the 1 to 1 salts go relatively quickly to 1 because, you know, at this value here they're all about around about 0.8. The 1 to 2 salts at this concentration are about 0.6, so they're further away. Well, we might have expected that because they have more charge. So they go slower to 1 as you dilute them because they have larger charges. Um, and also the 1 to 1 salts all sort of go together and the 1 to 2 salts all sort of, well, these are quite different out here, but they're certainly closer up here than the 1 to 1 salts. So they sort of go in families. What I want to point out to you is how different the F values are from 1. Look at this. Ionic strength 0.5, so that we can say 0.5 molar roughly. For the 1 to 1 salts, it's around about 0.7. 0.7. So if you actually used the real concentration, the real activity, the effective concentration, it's about 30% reduced from the actual concentration. That's a 30% error. 30%. That's large. Look how big it is uh, for a 1 molar Na2SO4 solution. The value is 0.3. 0.3, that means at a one molar solution, Na2SO4, we have a 300% error, more than a 300% error, if we use a concentration without taking into account the F value, because the F value will reduce the actual concentration to a value of 0.3 times the actual concentration to give the activity, right? Even for N NaCl, look at Na, here's seawater, at about this ionic strength, NaCl, uh, which is these circles here, would have an F value around about 0.65. So, yeah, we can say it's about a 50% error if we get those things wrong. So if you're taking into account equilibria type calculations and modeling of, I don't know what, dissolving of CO2, uh, precipitation of calcium carbonate in the shells of small animals that live in the ocean that form the base of the food chain. Important calculations, calculations that humanity may in the end depend on. You need to take into account these effects. It's also interesting to note that as well as going to one on this side, as the solutions become very, very concentrated, they start going back up to one. First they go down and then they go back up to one. That's because Whenever we have pure solutions, we, the activity is equal to the concentration. So as you start removing water, 
we start getting more and more pure NaCl, for example, and uh, the species becomes perhaps again going back up to one. It doesn't always do that, but you can see that in some cases we have a minimum starting at one, going down to a minimum, and then perhaps gradually or slowly going back up to one. We can see that Na2SO4 is not like that. It keeps going down. Now, we looked at these models here, the Davies model, and uh, for these uh, curves, and you can see the Davies model works pretty well uh, at low concentrations, perhaps, you know, concentrations less than well, we can say 0.1 or 0.01. Maybe 0.01 would be would be certainly a better model. Uh, and we and, and you can imagine getting better models for different concentrations. We need formulas for these activity conf, you know, coefficients if we're going to take them into account in our k constant equations to figure out speciation. Now there are different types of formula. There's the Debye-Huckel model, which is the earliest one. Um, here it's valid for i less than, well, it says here 5 times 10 to the minus 3, certainly 10 to the minus 2. You can use the by Huckel. And here's a formula, a formula derived from this theory. We're not going to go into the theory, and you don't need to memorize these formulas. The log f depends on a constant times zi squared times the ionic strength square rooted. i to the power one half is the square root of the ionic strength. That's the debye huckel formula for the logarithm of the activity coefficient. And that's what's plotted. Uh, well, that's not plotted here. This is the Davies equation. That's the next. Uh, that's the equation down here, which is valid for i less than 0.5 ionic strength. And you can see it has a different formula. All of them have a minus a times zi squared as the first term and then some other kind of formula depending on the ionic strength of various kinds. In some cases, in the case of the extended debye huckel there's a different constant, B. What is this constant? It's 0.5 for water, B is 0.33. Uh, in some cases uh, there is uh, an ionic size of the species and that's in angstroms appearing here. These are purely empirical formulas just fitted to the experimental data. Perhaps there is some theoretical justification we I don't know about that you can use these formula but please keep in mind that you know the Davies equation for instance it's not that good it gives you a ballpark figure but its error around about one here for the one-to-one -one species would be about 0.2 units 0.1 plus or minus that's quite large the error of this formula is quite large. So it may be better to be measuring data at appropriate concentrations that you're interested in and getting conditional constants rather than trying to guesstimate what this Fi value actually is. Okay, that's it. See ya.